Chapter 8 I don't believe in defeat. If you are thinking thoughts of defeat, I urge you to rid yourself of such thoughts, for as you think defeat you tend to get it. Adopt the, I don't believe in defeat, attitude. I want to tell you about some people who have put this philosophy into effect with excellent results and shall explain the techniques and formulas which they used so successfully. If you read these incidents carefully and thoughtfully and believe as they did and think positively and put these techniques into operation, you too, can overcome defeats which at the present moment may seem inevitable. I hope you are not like an obstacle man, of whom I was told. He was called an obstacle man because, regardless of whatever suggestion was advanced, his mind instantly went to all possible obstacles in connection with it, but he met his match and learned a lesson which helped to change his negative attitude. It came about in the following manner. The directors of his firm had a project under consideration which involved considerable expense and some definite hazards as well as success possibilities. In the discussions regarding this venture the obstacle man would invariably say, and always with a scholarly air, invariably this type acts wise, probably a cover-up for inner doubt feelings, now just a moment. Let's consider the obstacles involved. Another man, who said very little but who was respected by his associates for his ability and achievements and for a certain indomitable quality which characterized him, presently spoke up and asked, why do you constantly emphasize the obstacles in this proposition instead of the possibilities? Because, replied the obstacle man, to be intelligent one must always be realistic, and it is a fact that there are certain definite obstacles in connection with this project. What attitude would you take toward these obstacles, may I ask? The other man unhesitatingly replied, what attitude would I take toward these obstacles? Why, I would just remove them that's all, and then I would forget them. But, said the obstacle man, that is easier said than done. You say you would remove them and then you would forget them. May I ask if you have any technique for removing obstacles and for forgetting them that the rest of us have never discovered? A slow smile came over the face of the other man as he said, Son, I have spent my entire life removing obstacles and I never yet saw one that could not be removed provided you had enough faith and guts and were willing to work. Since you want to know how it's done, I will show you. He then reached into his pocket and took out his wallet. Under the ising glass window was a card on which were written some words. He shoved the wallet across the table and said, There, son, read that. That is my formula and don't give me the song and dance that it won't work either. I know better from experience. The obstacle man picked up the wallet and with a strange look on his face read the words to himself. Read them out loud, urged the owner of the wallet. This is what he read in a slow, dubious voice, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 the owner of the wallet put it back in his pocket and said, I have lived a long time and have faced a lot of difficulties in my time, but there is power in those words actual power and with them you can remove any obstacle. He said this with confidence and everybody knew he meant it. This positiveness, together with the facts of his experience which were known to all, for he was a remarkable man who had overcome many odds, and because of the further fact that he was not in any sense holier than thou, made his words convincing to the men around the table. At any rate, there was no more negative talk. The project was put into operation and, despite difficulties and risks, turned out successfully. The technique used by this man is based on the primary fact about an obstacle which is don't be afraid of it. Practice believing that God is with you and that in combination with him you have the power to handle it. So the first thing to do about an obstacle is simply to stand up to it and not complain about it or whine under it but forthrightly attack it. Don't go crawling through life on your hands and knees half defeated. Stand up to your obstacles and do something about them. You will find that they haven't half the strength you think they have. A friend in England sent me a book by Winston Churchill entitled Maxims and Reflections. In this book Churchill tells of the British General Tudor who commanded a division of the British 5th Army which faced the great German assault in March 1918. The odds were heavily against him, but General Tudor knew how to meet an apparently immovable and undefeatable obstacle. His method was simple. 
He merely stood and let the obstacle break on him and he, in turn, broke the obstacle. Here is what Churchill said about General Tudor. This is a very great sentence and it is filled with power, the impression I had of Tudor was of an iron peg, hammered into the frozen ground, immovable. General Tudor knew how to stand up to an obstacle. Just stand up to it, that's all, and don't give way under it, and it will finally break you will break it. Something has to break, and it won't be you, it will be the obstacle. You can do this when you have faith, faith in God and faith in yourself. Faith is the chief quality you need. It is enough. In fact, it is more than enough. Use that formula which the businessman suggested and you will develop this brand of powerful faith in God and in yourself. You will learn to know yourself, your own ability, your power to do things. To the degree to which your attitude shifts from negative to positive the mastery touch will come to you. Then, with assurance, you can say to yourself under any and all circumstances and mean it, I don't believe in defeat. Take the story of Gonzalez, who won the national tennis championship a few years ago in a grueling battle. He had been practically unknown, and because of wet weather he had not been able to perfect his game prior to the tournament. The sports writer of a metropolitan newspaper in analyzing Gonzalez said that there were certain defects in his techniques, and gave it as his opinion that probably greater champions had played on the courts, however, he credited Gonzalez with a marvelous serve and a skillful volley. But the factor that won the championship, said the writer, was his staying power and the further fact that, he was never defeated by the discouraging vicissitudes of the game. That is one of the most subtle lines I have ever read in any sports story, he was never defeated by the discouraging vicissitudes of the game. It means, does it not, that when the game seemed to go against him he did not let discouragement creep in nor negative thoughts dominate and thus lose the power needed to win. This mental and spiritual quality made that man a champion. He was able to face obstacles, to stand up to them and overcome them. Faith supplies staying power. It contains dynamic to keep one going when the going is hard. Anybody can keep going when the going is good, but some extra ingredient is needed to enable you to keep fighting when it seems that everything is against you. It is a great secret, that of never being defeated by the discouraging vicissitudes of the game. You may counter, but you don't know my circumstances. I am in a different situation than anybody else and I am as far down as a human being can get. In that case you are fortunate, for if you are as far down as you can get there is no further down you can go. There is only one direction you can take from this position, and that is up. So your situation is quite encouraging. However, I caution you not to take the attitude that you are in a situation in which nobody has ever been before. There is no such situation. Practically speaking, there are only a few human stories and they have all been enacted previously. This is a fact that you must never forget there are people who have overcome every conceivable difficult situation, even the one in which you now find yourself and which to you seems utterly hopeless. So did it seem to some others, but they found an out, a way up, a path over, a pass through. One of the most inspiring illustrations of this act is the story of Amos Parrish who twice every year brings together hundreds of leading department store executives and style experts in two huge clinics held in the grand ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At these clinics Mr. Parrish gives advice to the merchants and their associates on business trends, on merchandise, on selling methods, and other matters important to the conduct of their business. Having attended a number of the clinics, however, I am convinced that the greatest values Mr. Parrish transmits to his customers are courage and positive thinking, a deep belief in themselves, and the confidence that they can overcome all difficulties. He seems a living example of the philosophy which he teaches. As a boy he was sickly. Moreover, he stuttered. He was sensitive and a victim of an inferiority complex. It was thought that he would not live because of his weakened physical condition, but one day Amos Parrish had a spiritual experience. Faith dawned in his mind, and from then on he knew that with the help of God and the utilization of his own powers he could achieve. He developed a unique idea of service to businessmen, 
and so highly do they rate it that they are willing to pay large fees to attend a two-day session twice a year under the business wisdom and inspiration of Amos Parrish. To me it is a moving experience to sit with that big crowd in a hotel ballroom and listen to AP, as he is affectionately called, talk positive thinking to those important businessmen and women. Sometimes he has the greatest difficulty with his stuttering, but he is never discouraged. He refers to it frankly and with a sense of humor. One day, for example, he was trying to say the word Cadillac. He tried several times and was unable to get it out, and finally did so with a powerful effort. Then he commented, I can't even say CCC Cadillac, let alone buy one. The audience roared with laughter, but I noted that they looked up at him with affection written on their faces. Everyone leaves a meeting at which he speaks with the conviction that they, too, can turn their obstacles into assets. Again I repeat, there is no difficulty you cannot overcome. A wise and philosophical Negro man once said to me, when asked how he overcame his difficulties, how do I get through a trouble? Well, first I try to go around it, and if I can't go around it, I try to get under it, and if I can't get under it, I try to go over it, and if I can't get over it, I just plow right through it. Then he added, God and I plow right through it. Take seriously that formula of a businessman given earlier in this chapter. Stop reading for a moment and repeat it over to yourself five times, and each time you say it conclude with this affirmation, I believe that. Here is the formula again, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Philippians 4.13, say that five times every day and it will release indomitable power in your mind. Your subconscious, which always resents any change, may say to you, you don't believe any such thing. But remember that your subconscious mind in a sense is one of the greatest liars in existence. It concurs in and sends back to you your own errors about your abilities. You have created the negative attitude in your subconscious and it gives this error back to you. So just turn on your subconscious and say to it, now look here, I do believe that. I insist upon believing it. If you talk to your subconscious mind with that positiveness, in due course it will be convinced. One reason is because you are now feeding it positive thoughts. In other words, you are at last telling the truth to your subconscious. After a while your subconscious mind will begin to send back the truth to you, the truth being that with the help of Jesus Christ there isn't any obstacle you cannot overcome. An effective method for making your subconscious positive in character is to eliminate certain expressions of thought and speech which we may call the little negatives. These so-called little negatives clutter up the average person's conversation, and while each one is seemingly unimportant in itself, the total effect of these attitudes is to condition the mind negatively. When this thought of little negatives first occurred to me, I began to analyze my own conversational habits and was shocked by what I found. I discovered that I was making such statements as, I'm afraid I'll be late, or I wonder if I'll have a flat tire, or I don't think I can do that, or I'll never get through this job. There's so much to do. If something turned out badly, I might say, oh, that's just what I expected. Or, again, I might observe a few clouds in the sky and would gloomily state, I knew it was going to rain. These are little negatives, to be sure, and a big thought is of course more powerful than a little one, but it must never be forgotten that mighty oaks from little acorns grow, and if a mass of little negatives clutter up your conversation, they are bound to seep into your mind. It is surprising how they accumulate in force, and presently, before you know it, they will grow into big negatives. So I determined to go to work on the little negatives and root them out of my conversation. I found that the best way to eliminate them was deliberately to say a positive word about everything. When you keep asserting that things are going to work out well, that you can do the job, that you will not have a flat tire, that you will get there on time, by talking up good results you invoke the law of positive effects and good results occur. Things do turn out well. On a roadside billboard I saw an advertisement of a certain brand of motor oil. The slogan read, a clean engine always delivers power. So will a mind free of negatives produce positives, that is to say, a clean mind will deliver power. Therefore flush out your thoughts, give yourself a clean mental engine, 
remembering that a clean mind, even as a clean engine, always delivers power. So to overcome your obstacles and live the I don't believe in defeat philosophy, cultivate a positive idea pattern deeply in your consciousness. What we do with obstacles is directly determined by our mental attitude. Most of our obstacles, as a matter of fact, are mental in character. Ah, you may object, mine are not mental, mine are real. Perhaps so, but your attitude toward them is mental. The only possible way you can have an attitude is by the mental process, and what you think about your obstacles largely determines what you do about them. Form the mental attitude that you cannot remove an obstacle and you will not remove it, not if you think you can't. But get the idea firmly fixed that the obstacle is not so great as you previously considered it to be. Hold the idea that it is removable, and however faintly you entertain this positive thought, from the very moment you begin to think in this manner, the process is inaugurated which will lead to its ultimate removal. If you have been long defeated by a difficulty, it is probably because you have told yourself for weeks, months, and even for years that there is nothing you can do about it. You have so emphasized your inability to yourself that your mind gradually accepted the conclusion upon which you have insisted, and when your mind is convinced, you are convinced, for as you think so are you. But, on the contrary, when you employ this new and creative concept, I can do all things through Christ, then you develop a new mental slant. Emphasize and re-emphasize that positive attitude and you will finally convince your own consciousness that you can do something about difficulties. When at last your mind becomes convinced, astonishing results will begin to happen. Of a sudden you discover that you have the power you would never acknowledge. I played golf with a man who was not only an excellent golfer but a philosopher as well. As we went around the golf course the game itself drew out of him certain gems of wisdom for one of which I shall ever be grateful. I hit a ball into the rough, into some high grass. When we came up to my ball I said in some dismay, now just look at that. I certainly am in the rough. I have a bad lie. It is going to be tough getting out of here. My friend grinned and said, didn't I read something about positive thinking in your books? Sheepishly I acknowledged that such was the case. I wouldn't think negatively about that lie of yours, he said, do you think you could get a good hit if this ball were lying out on the fairway on the short grass? I said I thought so. Well, he continued, why do you think you could do better out there than here? Because, I replied, the grass is cut short on the fairway and the ball can get away better. Then he did a curious thing. Let's get down on our hands and knees, he suggested, and examine the situation. Let's see just how this ball does lie. So we got down on our hands and knees, and he said, observe that the relative height of the ball here is about the same as it would be on the fairway, the only difference being that you have about five or six inches of grass above the ball. Then he did an even more whimsical thing. Notice the quality and character of this grass, he said. He pulled off a blade and handed it to me. Chew it, he said. I chewed, and he asked, isn't that tender? Why, yes, I replied. It certainly does seem to be tender grass. Well, he continued, an easy swing of your number five iron will cut through that grass almost like a knife. And then he gave me this sentence which I am going to remember as long as I live, and I hope you will also. The rough is only mental. In other words, he continued, it is rough because you think it is. In your mind you have decided that here is an obstacle which will cause you difficulty. The power to overcome this obstacle is in your mind. If you visualize yourself lifting that ball out of the rough, believing you can do it, your mind will transfer flexibility, rhythm, and power to your muscles and you will handle that club in such a manner that the ball will rise right out of there in a beautiful shot. All you need to do is to keep your eye on that ball and tell yourself that you are going to lift it out of that grass with a lovely stroke. Let the stiffness and tension go out of you. Hit it with exhilaration and power. Remember, the rough is only mental. To this day I remember the thrill, the sense of power and delight I had in the clean shot that dropped the ball to the edge of the green. That is a very great fact to remember in connection with difficult problems, the rough is only mental. Your obstacles are present all right. They are not fanciful, 
but they are not actually so difficult as they seem. Your mental attitude is the most important factor. Believe that Almighty God has put in you the power to lift yourself out of the rough by keeping your eye firmly fixed on the source of your power. Affirm to yourself that through this power you can do anything you have to do. Believe that this power is taking the tension out of you, that this power is flowing through you. Believe this, and a sense of victory will come. Now take another look at that obstacle that has been bothering you. You will find that it isn't so formidable as you thought. Say to yourself, the rough is only mental. I think victory I get victory. Remember that formula. Write it on a piece of paper, put it in your wallet, stick it up on your mirror where you shave each morning, put it over the kitchen sink, put it on your dressing table and on your desk keep looking at it until its truth drives into the depths of your consciousness, until it permeates your whole mental attitude, until it becomes a positive obsession, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What may seem to be a difficult proposition is, as I have pointed out, hard or easy in proportion to how we think about it. It may be said that three men vitally affected the thought processes of Americans Emerson, Thoreau, and William James. Analyze the American mind even to this late date and it is evident that the teachings of these three philosophers combined to create that particular genius of the American who is not defeated by obstacles and who accomplishes impossibles with amazing efficiency. A fundamental doctrine of Emerson is that the human personality can be touched with divine power and thus greatness can be released from it. William James pointed out that the greatest factor in any undertaking is one's belief about it. Thoreau told us that the secret of achievement is to hold a picture of a successful outcome in mind. Still another wise American was Thomas Jefferson, who, like Franklin, set for his guidance a series of rules. Franklin had 13 daily rules, Jefferson only 10. One of Jefferson's rules was this, and I think it is priceless, always take hold of things by the smooth handle. That is, go at a job or at your difficulty by the use of a method that will encounter the least resistance. Resistance causes friction in mechanics, therefore it is necessary in mechanics to overcome or reduce friction. The negative attitude is a friction approach. That is why negativism develops such great resistance. The positive approach is the smooth handle technique. It is in harmony with the flow of the universe. It not only encounters less resistance, but actually stimulates assistance forces. It is remarkable how from early life until the end of your existence the application of this philosophy will enable you to attain successful results in areas where otherwise you would be defeated. For example, a woman sent her 15-year-old son to us. She said she wanted him straightened out. It annoyed her to no end that her boy could never get over 70 in any of his studies. This boy has a great mind potentially, she declared proudly. How do you know he has a great mind? I asked. Because he is my son, she said. I graduated from college. Magna cum laude. The boy came in very glumly, so I asked, what's the matter, son? I don't know. My mother sent me to see you. Well, I commented, you don't seem to be burning with enthusiasm. Your mother says you get only 70s. Yes, he said, that's all I get, and, he added, that isn't the worst of it. I've even received less than that. Do you think you have a good mind, son? I asked. My mother says I have. I don't know I think I'm awful dumb. Dr. Peel, he said earnestly, I study the stuff. At home I read it over once and then close the book and try to remember it. I repeat this process about three times, and then I think that if three times doesn't get it into my head how am I ever going to get it into my head? And then I go to school thinking maybe I have it, and the teacher calls on me to say something, and I stand up and can't remember a thing. Then, he said, examinations come along and I sit there and just get hot and cold all over and I can't think of the answers. I don't know why, he continued. I know that my mother was a great scholar. I guess I just haven't got it in me. This negative thought pattern combined with the inferiority feeling stimulated by his mother's attitude was of course overwhelming him. He froze up in his mind. His mother had never told him to go to school and study for the wonder and glory of learning knowledge. 
She was not wise enough to encourage him to compete with himself rather than with others. And she was constantly insisting that he duplicate her success in scholarship. Little wonder that under this pressure he froze mentally. I gave him some suggestions that proved helpful. Before you read your lessons, pause a moment and pray in this manner, Lord, I know I have a good mind and that I can get my work. Then get yourself relaxed and read the book without strain. Imagine you are reading a story. Do not read it twice unless you wish. Simply believe that you got it on the first reading. Visualize the material as soaking in and germinating. Then next morning, as you go to school, say to yourself, I have a wonderful mother. She is very pretty and sweet, but she must have been an old bookworm to get those high marks. And who wants to be an old bookworm anyway? I don't want to become magna cum nothing. I only want to get through school creditably. In class, when the teacher calls on you, quickly pray before answering. Then believe the Lord will at that moment help. Your mind to deliver. When an examination is given, affirm in prayer that God is releasing your mind and that the right answers are given you. The boy followed these ideas, and what marks do you think he got the following semester? 90. I am sure that this boy, having discovered the amazing workability of the I don't believe in defeat philosophy, will employ the amazing power of positive thinking in all the affairs of his life. I could use so many illustrations of the manner in which men's lives have been revamped by these procedures that this book would grow to unwieldy size. Moreover, these are incidents and experiences out of everyday life that are in no way theoretical, but are entirely practical. My mail is literally filled with testimonials sent by people who, having heard or read accounts I have told of victorious life experiences, have felt moved to relate similar occurrences in their own lives. Such a letter came from a gentleman who tells about his father as follows. I know several people who have used the plan in this letter with amazing results. My father was a traveling salesman. One time he sold furniture, another time hardware, sometimes it was leather goods. He changed his line every year. I would hear him telling mother that this was his last trip in stationery or in bed lamps or whatever it was he was selling at the moment. Next year everything would be different, we would be on easy street. He had a chance to go with a firm that had a product that sold itself. It was always the same. My father never had a product that sold. He was always tense, always afraid of himself, always whistling in the dark. Then one day a fellow salesman gave father a copy of a little three-sentence prayer. He was told to repeat it just before calling on a customer. Father tried it and the results were almost miraculous. He sold 85% of all calls made during the first week, and every week thereafter the results were wonderful. Some weeks the percentage ran as high as 95, and father had 16 weeks in which he sold every customer called on. Father gave this prayer to several other salesmen, and in each case it brought astounding results. The prayer my father used is as follows. I believe I am always divinely guided. I believe I will always take the right turn of the road. I believe God will always make a way where there is no way. The head of a small firm who had a great many difficulties in establishing his business told me that he was immeasurably helped by a technique which he invented. He had trouble, he said, with the tendency to blow up a small difficulty into a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. He knew that he was approaching his problems in a defeatist attitude, and had common sense enough to realize that these obstacles were not so difficult as he made them appear to be. As he told the story, I wondered if he did not have that curious psychological difficulty known as the will to fail. He employed a device which reconditioned his mental attitude and after a time had a noticeable effect on his business. He simply placed a large wire basket on his office desk. The following words were printed on a card and wired to this basket, with God all things are possible. Whenever a problem came up which the old mechanism of defeat began to develop into a big difficulty, he threw the paper pertaining to it into the basket marked, with God all things are possible, and let it rest there for a day or two. It is queer. How each matter when I took it out of that basket again didn't seem difficult at all, he reported. In this act he dramatized the mental attitude of putting the problem in God's hands. 
As a result he received power to handle the problem normally and therefore successfully. As you finish this chapter please say the following line aloud, I don't believe in defeat. Continue to affirm that until the idea dominates your subconscious attitudes.